there are three areas that we can be an advocate for ending violence against women. And I like to categorize these in three areas, prevention, intervention, and champion. And that is champion in both the noun and the verb context. So November is Women's Abuse Prevention Slash Awareness Month. November 25th is the uh, International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women and is also the kickoff date for the 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence. The 16 Days of Activism recognizes the different tragedies that have taken place against women, including the December 6, 1989 Montreal massacre of 14 university engineering students who happened to be women. I mention that because I am in Canada. In this video, I will share 32 calls to action. A lot of us might be wanting to help make a difference, do something, but not really know how. So I've done the research and I've composed um, 32 action items from the research, and hopefully you can put some of those into action. Uh, the areas that I'm talking about, prevention, intervention, and champion, talk to actions that we can take before, during, and after we know of a woman that has experienced victimization. These are 32 things that you can do to be an active participant in helping to end violence against women. The visuals that I'm going to share um, with the 32 calls to action were actually created by UN women. So I'm gonna include a link to those uh, social media posts in the description below. One of the recommended ways to show support for ending violence against women is to conduct peer-led activities and social media campaigns. So if you wanna do your own social media campaign, you'll have the link to those um, in the description. And I'll warn you in advance that some of the points I cover may be triggering for some of you. Now, they may be triggering because you have personal experience with trauma or because the views and ideas that I might share might be in opposition to your personal ideology. So, however, in order to learn and grow, we need to venture into the fear zone, work our way through it into the learning zone where we can then grow and develop and use our critical thinking skills. And hey, you don't have to agree with me with uh, what I say or the ideas present, but at least it'll be food for thought and potentially start a conversation. So I'm going to share these calls to action in reverse order, starting with champion. Let me go to the champion. Okay, so what does that mean, a champion? So a champion in the noun form means uh, someone that advocates, someone that is an advocate for themselves or for uh, someone else who's, you know, been victimized or, or someone that needs uh, support. And then the verb form is the actual action that you take to support that person, how you be a champion, how you as a champion, be a champion or champion uh, through action. So you can be a champion for women by showing support in both tangible and intangible ways. So let's get started with the first call to action. And for this, I'm going to put on my glasses. Okay. So the first way is to give victims a voice and believe them. So if a woman finds the courage to tell you that something has happened to her, believe her. It's estimated that one in three women will experience sexual violence and only 5% of sexual assaults are even reported. And one of the reasons uh, for this, according to the research, is that women feel that they won't be believed. So first action step, believe someone if they tell you they've been victimized. Action item number two is be there for survivors. Let them know that they're not alone. Um, victims of violence or sexual assault often feel shame and isolation. So supporting a victim of violence in both intangible and tangible ways can help them take their power back. So be there. Okay. 
the third way, third action item is not to simply offer your help. Like say, oh, if you need anything, call me, take action and give people help. Encourage your friend, um, to report what has taken place. If someone has support, um, they know they have a shoulder to lean on. They're going to be more um, inclined to report what has happened and seek help. And sometimes, uh, that person, they might, their, their, um, thought process might be very clouded and they're very confused. So helping them devise a strategy, communicating with them, letting them know how to reach you, how you can reach them, and then, you know, make a safety plan. That's one of the recommendations if someone needs to leave a, uh, say domestic violence situation is to, to make a plan. And that can be really hard if you're, um, you know, going through a lot of stress. Okay. Action item number four is to pay attention to the signs of abuse in others and be ready to act. So pay attention to your sixth sense, that gnawing feeling you get in your stomach. For instance, do you know a woman who is being harassed or controlled by their partner? Do you, do you notice that they seem anxious or maybe their personal habits have changed? Like say, say hygiene or, or their activities, things, things like that. So pay attention to signs of abuse and be ready to act. Okay. Action item number five, be aware of the lesser known, uh, forms of domestic abuse, including stalking, spiritual abuse, financial abuse, and cyber violence. Just because you don't see bruises or black eyes doesn't mean abuse isn't happening. Okay. Action item number six, uh, okay. Address systematic barriers in the legal system. So advocate for vic- victims and be the strength for that victim who may be feeling defeated or weak or helpless. You know, from personal experience, this is going to be a trigger warning. I was hired to speak for an organization who later canceled my speaking engagement because apparently the organizer was told by a retired member of law enforcement that I shouldn't be shooting my mouth off about what happened to me. So as you can imagine, that infuriated me. So I followed up with the courts to inquire about why that person was told this. And the reason I was given was that they needed to ensure that my rapist and attempted murderer got a fair trial. And they also wanted to ensure that the uh, trial would not be moved out of the convenience of the local superior court. So not talking anything, not talking about it had nothing to do with protecting me as the victim and everything to do with protecting the criminal. So clearly there are systematic barriers in Canada in our justice system that need to be addressed. And victims can succumb to learned helplessness and feel that they are powerless to influence change or justice. And that has been uh, the case with me on a personal level. Okay. Action item number seven, (laughs) hold perpetrators accountable. We've all heard the cliche that boys will be boys, right? In fact, Dua Lipa has a song named boys will be boys that uh, says in the first few lines, I'm going to switch over scenes here and go to, go to that. Hopefully I can. Ooh, Yes. So it starts off the first couple of paragraphs. It's second nature to walk home before the sun goes down and put your keys between your knuckles when there's boys around. Isn't it funny how we laugh it off to hide our fear when there's nothing funny here? Sick intuition that they taught us so we won't freak out. We hide our figures doing anything to shut them out. We smile, a way to ease the tension so it don't go south, but there's nothing funny now. I find that particular song has a lot of meaning to me now, and uh, whereas before, not so much. So we need to discontinue using the term boys will be boys when it comes to the treatment of girls and women. 
Okay, action item number eight is <laughs> contribute your time and resources to organizations and initiatives that help victims. There are likely several women's shelters in your own community that could use your support. Um, you could also align with organizations that support women and girls development in the community or help them out in a practical way by providing mentorship or scholarships or job opportunities to women. In our own community, we have, you know, big brothers and sisters, we have Girls Inc. Um, and there's lots of different organizations that I'm sure you have similar ones in your own community that you can contribute your time and resources, volunteer in, in some way. Okay, so that covers the first, the first part, the first area in, in terms of being a champion, how you can uh, support women after they've been victimized. So the next the next area that I'm going to talk about is intervention. Okay, so let me let me pull this up here. Okay, so intervention is going to be, I mean, you've probably heard the term um, bystander apathy, and, and I'm going to go into that a little bit in a minute, but it takes guts to intervene. And intervention doesn't mean you need to put yourself in a dangerous position. It just means you need to speak up. Okay, so let's get going. Uh, we'll go with action item number nine, and that is change the attitudes and narratives around rape. So while doing my research on victim blaming, I came across a lot of articles, as you can imagine, but I'm going to share one with you that, that I came across that I found just really, really distressing. So I came across this article called Tweeting Rape Culture. It talks to the prevalence of a victim blaming narrative on social media around two high profile rape cases uh, in the United States. The article talks about a virgin whore binary and a just world hypothesis. And that is the belief that bad things happen to bad people and that there are virgins and whores or that rape is merely a deviant event that happens to girls who behave or dress inappropriately. We need to seriously uh, look at changing the narrative and attitudes around rape. So if you're a woman, understand your rights and your value. No one has the right to touch you under any circumstances without your permission. I will leave the link to that article in the description below if you are interested in um, researching that some more. Okay, so moving right along, we're going to go to action item number 10. So <laughs> recognize again, and challenge victim blaming. In my research, I came across several articles where the results indicated that the more fundamentalist and sexist clergy were, the more negative their attitudes were towards victims of rape. And women who didn't abide by traditional submissive gender roles uh, were not shown as much compassion as others. The results indicate that most clergy blame the victim and adhere to rape myths. Therefore, they need to be more educated about sexual assault. So one of the articles that I came across uh, that highlights that is this one here. So clergy's attitudes and attributions of blame towards female rape victims. And I bring this up because... Um, you know, there's social media and we know how toxic social media can be. So it's almost not surprising that there's victim blaming going on there. But then the uh, religious organizations, those kind of structures are meant to give comfort to people. And what these articles show is that a lot of times women aren't comforted um, by their fundamentalist religious organizations. In fact, they are blamed for their victimization. So that's definitely something that needs to change, an action item that needs to change. Okay. Action item number 11. Let's move on to that one now. All right. 
not asking for it, no matter how you're dressed, no matter what you're doing, no matter who you're with, no matter what you've had to drink, no matter whether you flirted or not, you're never asking for it in terms of being raped or beaten. Never. It's not your fault ever. So in a previous video I posted about victim blaming, I shared an article from the religion of my upbringing to demonstrate how often religious leaders place the blame for rape on women. And it's as if men have no self-control or accountability. So I'm going to find this, this article for you. Let me turn this off. Okay, let me just move my, move my face out of the way. <laughs> okay, it looks like I'm facing in the opposite direction, but it's just the mirroring of the camera. So you'll notice in this article that it starts off with the question, why are girls often so easily raped? What kind of a question is that? So I underlined the things that really stood out to me. So their first mistake, and then it goes on. And their second mistake is, and then later the next mistake. So all of the blame is being put on the woman for her victimization. Again, as if men have no self-control, no accountability whatsoever. So Clearly, religious organizations, especially fundamentalist religious organizations, have a lot of work to do when it comes to not um, re-victimizing uh, females in their uh, organizations. So let's move right along to action item number 12. Recognize and stop behaviors that normalize violence. Okay, so how do we do that? One person that I follow on uh, Instagram who advocates for a change in the narrative around um, sayings like fight like a man is Mark Green. So I'm just going to switch over to uh, Mark Green's profile. Okay, Mark Green, here we are. <laughs> okay, so, so Mark Green, if you go on his um, Instagram, he posts a lot about changing the narrative around manhood, you know, not having, um, making boys feel like, you know, they need to abide by that macho kind of attitude that is, you know, from, uh, past years, I'm trying to find the words to say. So in here, it says Mark Green writes, speaks, consults, and coaches on relational practices, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and masculinity for organizations worldwide. This focus is on overcoming challenges men, women, and non-binary people face due to the harmful impact of domination-based culture of masculinity. So I'm going to show a couple of other uh, men that are advocates of women, but this one, uh, this particular gentleman is... Um, man, I'm not supposed to say gentleman. Um, this, this man has, uh, written books. He's, um, uh, very active on social media. He's, he's a coach. Clearly he's someone that is, uh, um, intervening, taking action to help and, uh, do his part to end violence against women. Okay. So moving right along action item number 13 is to challenge gender inequality. Seems simple, right? <laughs> We're all familiar with diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, but there's a conundrum that exists in our political system that promotes the freedom of religion. While freedom of religion is mostly good, I, I admit that these freedoms often exclude religious organizations from diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts um, in the name of religious freedom. For instance, in my own upbringing as a Jehovah's Witness, I previously was not anymore, uh, women in the Jehovah's Witness religion are indoctrinated to be in submission to men, to be deferential to men. They're taught to accept that only men have the right to be in positions of authority. And what's baffling 
is that women are conditioned to accept this and they forfeit any aspirations to use their intelligence and skills in a meaningful way outside of the home or the congregation. In fact, one of the leaders of that organization had this to say about women. You know, scientists say that the cranial capacity of a woman is 10% smaller than that of a man. So now this shows that she's just not equipped for the role of headship. Her role is one of subjection to the man. As you can imagine, <laughs> That uh, infuriates me, but it's also laughable because it's such an unintelligent thing to say. And if he's trying to position men as superior to women, he did a really bad job of it right there. <laughs> so they also, this organization and potentially others, reject homosexuality and sexual orientation that is not purely heterosexual, which is yet another way this organization rejects diversity, equity, and inclusion. And really that helps to uh, perpetuate gender-based violence. All right, so moving right along, we're going to action item number 14. <laughs> action number 14. Be positive role models, guys, <laughs> and teach your boys to be uh, positive role models. Be positive role models for your guys. There are several men and organizations, I've already introduced one, Mark Green, led by men that advocate for women's rights and an end to gender-based violence. One of those organizations is White Ribbon. So I'm going to hop on over to White Ribbon and show that. Okay, so who, who is White Ribbon? What You might have heard of the um, Walk a Mile in Her Shoes. Let me see if I can find that campaigns. Um, walk a Mile in Her Shoes where, where men will wear um, high heel shoes and walk, I guess, a mile uh, to raise, raise money and, and to advocate for an end to violence against women. But this is quite an extensive... Um, website and it's worth in uh, researching because it's quite possible that you know you're not even aware that there is a large organization of men and if you see up here in the in the logo 30 years that's been around and they are advocates and allies of gender equality so this is one organization that's uh doing a, a great job of being an advocate all right and another Another person, uh, let me see if I can find him, is this guy here, Jackson, Jackson Katz, Katz or Kates, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. He wrote this book, The Macho Paradox. Um, and if you check out his website, you'll, you'll see that he does a lot of public speaking. I'm trying to think here. Yeah, all right, so public speaking for... Uh, let me see. It came up. Okay. Military sexual harassment training, education training and consulting business training and consulting all helping to send a message, uh, about, you know, the concept of masculinity and how we can work together to stop the violence against women, especially in these very, uh, sort of male dominated, um, sort of in not industries, but, um, in, well, whatever. So <laughs> with, with the military, you, you know what I mean? So things that are, are very much male dominated, um, having a, a man go in and talk about how to kind of work towards gender equality is, is quite impressive. So that's three, three people that I've, that I've mentioned. Well, three, three organizations. So you have Mark Green, uh, White Ribbon, and uh, Jackson Katz. And I'm sure there's more. If there are more, please, please do share uh, them with me because I'd be more than happy to uh, promote those as well. Okay, so moving right along to action item number 15. Action item number 15. Speak up against sexist jokes, comments, and behavior. 
So when we hear the, hear the term uh, sexual harassment, we may be inclined to think of it only in terms of jokes and comments and behaviors. Um, but there's more to it than that. And it's actually quite interesting what I came across in my research. I'm going to share uh, what I came across. One form of sexual harassment is uh, gender-based harassment. So let me just pull up that. Okay. So in my research, I came across this, um, uh, document policy on preventing sexual and gender-based harassment. It's a, it's a Ontario rights commission document. And if you scroll through it, I'll leave the link to this in the description below as well. But if you want to see, you know, it starts off with what is sexual harassment and what is gender-based harassment. So sexual harassment, um, is any course of vexatious comment, vexatious comment or conduct that is known or ought to be known to be unwelcome. Okay. That's pretty self-explanatory, but let's move down to where uh, it talks about what is gender-based harassment. So gender-based harassment is one type of sexual harassment. Gender-based harassment is any behavior that polices and reinforces traditional heterosexual gender norms. It is often used to get people to follow traditional sex stereotypes, dominant males, subservient females. It is also used as a bullying tactic, often between members of the same sex. So I find it really interesting that um, the Human Rights Commission, the policy against sexual harassment, addresses those subscribed, ascribed, prescribed, um, traditional gender roles that a lot of women, uh, men too, but a lot of women get lumped into that. You must be, a, a, a wife and mother. You're, you're less than a man. You're not as intelligent as a man. You're not, um, you know, you don't have as much potential as a man, like all of those things that kind of feed into that traditional, um, gender stereotype is actually gender-based harassment, which is part of the umbrella of sexual harassment. And this is interesting to me because it wasn't something I was uh, fully aware of until I came across this document. Okay. So we need to put an end <laughs> to that. Um, Ending sexual harassment, it's its going to mean doing more than speaking up against sexist jokes and comments. It's going to have to include being mindful of the expectations um, that we place on people based on their chosen gender. And this goes for women as well as men. Okay, so moving right along to action item number 16. Let me pull this one up. All right. Yes. Influence your circle of connections. <laughs> All right. And this is going to be, um, a carryover from, from the lot, the last comment until I was attacked. Uh, my husband wasn't really consciously aware of the cute little comments that might be perceived as de uh, demeaning or disrespectful. And this is because cat calling and sexist jokes have been normalized. I mean, hopefully we're starting to put an end to that, but for the most part, they've been normalized. So change often starts with self-awareness. And that is one of the goals of this video and this campaign to create awareness. So my husband, as a consequence of my attack is now a hundred percent consciously aware of things that are just not cool to say, you know, that we both grew up in in the eighties and, you know, things were very different back then. And no doubt things will be different 20, 30 years from now. But when things are normalized, you just grow up thinking things are okay when they're not. So I'm here to help advocate for ending uh, language that is, that is demeaning to women and girls. Okay. So action item number 17 Avoid and counter locker room talk. Again, feeding off the last couple of comments. It takes courage to speak up and shut down locker room talk. But once a standard is set, 
even if it's initially really uncomfortable. Others will know that you're not willing to tolerate demeaning comments uh, about women. And you may lose some unsavory, unsavory friends, but really that's no great loss, is it? <laughs> okay. Action item number 18 is to be mindful of your own words and actions, particularly online. So another form of sexual harassment is cyber harassment. We need to be mindful of our words uh, online, especially because there's so much anonymity online. But in emails, blogs, social, uh, social media, networking sites, chat rooms, dating websites, um, and even text messaging, uh, it's very, it could be very easy for someone to get um, involved with sexual harassment, especially if there's um, an argument of some kind going on. Okay. All right. So action item not number 19. I'm going to pull up something on online in a second, but to be honest, when I read this uh, call to action, uh, reject rape jokes and metaphors, I, I had to look up what a rape joke and rape metaphor was. Um, when I, what, what I came across was, it was pretty enlightening. Um, for instance, this video, let me pull up this video. All right. Be prepared to, uh, <laughs> be shocked a little bit. Maybe I won't play the full two minutes, but you'll get the point pretty quickly. This good. Get ready to get gang raped again, folks. Let me just put it in graphic terms. It is going to be a gang rape. There is going to be a gang rape by a Democratic Party. Mental rape that's going on. The children's minds are being raped by the homosexual mafia. That's my position. They're raping our children's minds. You know, pretty much raping the pocketbooks of the rich to give to the poor. It's nothing other than a government-sanctioned rape. We need somebody on the Supreme Court who can understand how people in the private sector are getting raped. Okay, I think, I think you get the point. <laughs> um, but this is the kind of rape metaphor that, that I came across um, that really needs to stop. Uh, just because words have a certain meaning doesn't mean those words should be used. So like English words often have more than one meaning. So when the word rape is used as uh, in a metaphor context, such in this, as in this video, the meaning may be used correctly, um, but it, it, I'm going to switch, switch angles here. <laughs> um, it just, it doesn't mean it should be used. It's not right to use words like that for, um, especially in consideration of people who have endured rape or, um, or, and maybe are, are enduring it privately and uh, in, uh, in isolation. So constantly using a word like that is, is disrespectful and, um, inappropriate. And rape jokes, well, uh, all you have to do is, is look at what a, what a rape is. And really it's like, um, what's worse than having a bad hair day being raped. I mean, why would you even tell a joke like that? It doesn't, doesn't make any sense, but there's lots of words in the English, English language that we don't use anymore. And I'm sure you can think of a few, uh, because it's not appropriate to use them anymore. So that, that is, um, one word that we should be very mindful of when, when we're using it. Okay. Moving right along. Action item number 20. All right. Break the silence, be an active bystander. What does it mean to be an active bystander? You may be familiar with the term, uh, bystander apathy. It's a term from psychology and sociology classes about the tendency for people to do nothing in a public situation when someone needs help and not because they don't care, but because they think someone else will step in and help. So they don't need to. So any action you take to support a victim or any action you take to intervene by speaking up and standing up for women shows that you are an active bystander. You're not standing by passively waiting for others to fix the problem. You take action. Mm -hmm. So I hope that you will be an active bystander. Okay. Call to action number 20. Whoa. Yes. We're moving into 20. We're moving into the prevention. We're into the third area of, um, ending violence against women and really everything in prevention, uh, falls under 
for the most part, education, different, different layers of that awareness. So stay with me because uh, there's, there's a few more to go through here. Okay. So how can we help prevent it <laughs> in the first place? So action item call to action 21 is promote high school prevention programs. Um, you know, as much as parents may not like to hear it, high school is around the age where, um, your teenagers are going to start experimenting with or without your consent. <laughs> so your consent will not necessarily be, uh, be sought. Um, but that is, a, a girl symbol. Sometimes I get confused, which is which, but just because you're a girl doesn't mean that you were a female a woman, uh, that you consent to being touched in any way. Okay. So call to action number 22 is to not only, um, connect with high schools, high school prevention programs, but also to promote post-secondary prevention programs. If you've watched any news, you know how common it is for there to be, um, a lot of rape happening, sexual assaults happening, uh, during frosh week at universities. It's, it's, it's almost confusing because you think, oh, these are, you know, educated young people that have been raised in good homes, quote unquote, why is this happening? Well, there's a lot more to the story than that. Um, and my sister-in-law who started the, uh, the, the Kimberly project, which is a charitable organization in Canada. Um, she's working on the development of curriculum for young young boys and girls, like, um, I think it's age three to seven or so something in, in that young, uh, age to teach social, emotional competence and empathy, um, in order to put, uh, an end to this kind of behavior, odd behavior at, at, uh, in that context, it's, it's very odd. Okay. So call to action number 23, no means no. So <laughs> create a consent culture. Like we just talked about respecting boundaries. If someone doesn't want you to touch them, don't touch them. You have no right to touch them. And especially for, uh, females, girls, women, um, you never have to think that when you say no, or well, maybe I didn't say it. No, no strong enough. And just saying no, that's it. No means no in every context in life. So take the blame off yourself. It's never your fault. Never. Okay. Call to action number 24. Understand what abuse is in order to prevent it. So like I was mentioning before, just because you don't see, uh, uh, you know, black and blue bruises, you know, eyes, whatever in a woman, um, it doesn't mean abuse isn't happening. And in fact, I think a lot of abuse is psychological, emotional, financial, all those other, uh, types of abuse that were, were mentioned before. So be aware of, of what's actually happening. Um, and, and just, you know, be conscious that abuse has many labels. <laughs> okay. Call to action number 25. <sighs> All right. <laughs> Challenge attitudes that perpetuate social norms. Okay. So when I first saw this image, um, it, I, I wasn't familiar with this term corrective rape. What does that even mean? So one of these images, you know, uh, <laughs> the way, the way it kind of talks to the backwards views and opinions of, of years gone by, you know, like, okay, if you, if you rape a woman who identifies as a lesbian, um, that that's going to correct the problem. I, I don't even know what to say. So if you weren't familiar with this term, corrective rape, you are now, um, it's definitely a violation of, of human rights and, being aware of it. This is where the, the prevention, um, umbrella part, um, uh, prevention area of this video comes in. Just be aware of all the layers of gender-based violence and violence against women. Just educate yourself so that you don't, um, help feed these kind of backwards views because corrective rape, that's just ridiculous. And I'm really sorry if you have, uh, personally experienced this in any way. Okay. Call to action 26. 
educate on gender roles, consent, and stereotypes. Okay, so here again, gender roles, consent, and stereotypes. So what is a gender role? Well, we have our parents and our grandparents' views of what those gender roles are. And I mean, hey, that's the generation they grew up in. We, we can sometimes understand um, why these things get passed down, right? But as we kind of come into a new, a new age of understanding, um, we need to be way more open-minded um, and not even, I don't even want to use the word tolerant because tolerant means it's kind of like you're putting up with something that's not good. So it's not even about that. It's just being aware, educating yourself on the different ways that people exist and the way that different ways that people are and how they identify. It's not up to us to judge a person's uh, choice in their life. We, we are just meant to, um, you know, live our life for ourselves and not, not be in, in the seat of judgment of others. So get an education about that. Okay. And action item call to action. I keep saying action item call to action. Number 27, promote healthy and equal relationships. Uh, so this, this image and intimate partner violence, so often, um, women end up being abused in intimate partner relationships because, um, they feel maybe helpless, lost. They, you know, if they, if they leave, they lose their home. Maybe they, they don't have the financial means. A lot of times, um, women who are in abusive situations, they haven't been allowed to earn their own money. They haven't been allowed to get an education. Um, they've, you know, they become financially dependent on their partner. There's many reasons why they might end up in these situations. So if you observe that in one of your friends, you know, again, be, be an ear, be a shoulder, um, that that person knows they have someone that will support them if, you know, they find the courage to leave such a situation, but also in our children, you know, if we observe them in unhealthy relationships, um, you know, make note of it, pay attention and, and say something so that even your, your adult kids know that, um, you're there for them if they, if they need the help. Okay. Call to action. <laughs> Number 28. Okay. So when I first saw this, <laughs> promote cultural change through awareness, that's what, what the call to action is. When I first saw this uh, image, I wasn't sure what FGM was. So I Googled it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop over and go to Google with you. All right. So I Googled what is F. FGM. And there it smacked me in the face. Female genital mutilation involves the partial or total removal of external female genitalia or other injury to the female genital organs for non-medical reasons. The practice has no health benefits for girls or women. So, you know how there's the, the video, video button on Google. So I clicked on it, uh, but didn't watch any videos. I, I wish I didn't even click on that because I came across an image that I'll never be able to get out of my head. So there was an image of a young girl, probably about 10 years old, with her legs spread, a woman that looked like probably her mother, uh, who was looking away and grimacing and this girl's face, she was either extremely scared in, in fear, or she was in excruciating pain. But the look on her face was absolute anguish and my heart broke. And I just thought, why, why does this happen? It's just completely unethical and a complete violation of a woman's rights, girl's rights. Um, but what I found really disturbing also about that picture is that the other two people in the image were women. 
the one holding her down probably was her mother. It kind of had that vibe. And the person cutting off her clitoris was a woman. Why would this happen? Just atrocious. Now, imagine being raised in a religion or a culture that socializes girls to think that it's okay to place girls and women in the position that they have no choice but to comply because of lack of power or rights. So there's obviously many layers to that because it happens to tens of thousands of young girls every year across the world. And it's not something I can uh, really research in great detail. I just, the, the images, I, I mean, maybe I should get a thicker skin, um, but it's just, um, just atrocious behavior. And now that I know what this, this means and I can, you know, maybe help prevent it in some, in some way by advocating for these women, even though this is a, a, um, long journey. Okay. So moving right along, we're going to go into another subset of, uh, call to action relating to cultural change through awareness, and that is child marriage. Okay. So this practice again is atrocious families selling their daughters as a source of income or to pay back debts. I recall, um, seeing a piece on CNN. I'm going to going to share it. So I recall coming across this video when I was watching the news, I think earlier this year. And I remember that it, it broke my heart. I, I was just flabbergasted, shocked how a family, I guess the father, cause he's uh, in charge or whatever of the family, um, decided to sell his daughter, nine-year-old daughter to a 55 year old man because he had to pay back debts that he owed something to, to that effect. And when I watched this video, I just thought, you know, how, how is it possible that this type of thing takes place? But the thing is <laughs> the practice of offering up daughters as property is not new. Um, do you recall the character Lot in the Bible? Well, one thing Lot is famous for is offering up his two virgin daughters to a mob to be gang raped. And there's no yeah, but explanation for what he did. There's not, I'm sorry. There's no acceptable reason for a man to do that kind of a thing. Both then and now daughters are often regarded as property to be offered up as a bargaining tool. It's sickening. Now you may conclude that these practices are vile and a clear violation of women's rights and would never happen here, here as in the Western world. But let me ask you this, are we raising our girls in social structures that teach them to believe that the role of women is to be primarily a good wife and mother only? Do we socialize them to be submissive, subservient, and deferent to men? With all of the recent attention given to pronouns, it made me think, and this is a trigger warning. It's just food for thought, so don't attack me, but I'm putting it out there. Do we raise our girls to regard the concept of God as male? Why is the God of the trifecta of Abrahamic religions referred to in the pronoun he? Is it because holy books say that God is a he, but weren't the holy books written by men? If God is assigned the pronoun he, then clearly that sends the message that men are superior to women, doesn't it? It's just food for thought. I don't know. I'm just saying. I thought pronouns, hmm, God, he, him. Why do we call God, he, him? Who says, who's seen? <laughs> um, anyways, so if you, if you click off the video now, that's your right to do so, but it's just food for thought. Okay, so moving right along, we're going to go to call to action number 30. 
All right, deliver community prevention and awareness initiatives. So here's another thing that I didn't even know existed in, in my own community, human trafficking. You think of it as something that's taking place in another country, a really poor, um, poverty ravaged country, but it's not, it's happening right in our back door. What I learned is that there is a woman's shelter in our actual community that specifically helps girl, uh, girls, women who have been trafficked. And I'm going to just show you the, that website. So the organization is called safe hope home and they provide shelter and, uh, I'd say re rehabilitation, but I mean that in the sense that kind of gets them back on their feet, um, helps them with post-secondary education and just to stand on their own two feet again. Um, we've done some work with them and we're going to do some more work with them in the future. But if, uh, if you're looking for, um, uh, shelter to contribute your resources and time to that specifically targets, uh, victims of sex trafficking. This is one organization that, that does that. All right. We're in the home stretch. Okay. Call to action. Number 31. Learn about the consequences and costs of violence. Now, <laughs> I have to pull up some statistics here. I think a lot of us might be like, well, I don't, I don't beat women. I've never been, been beat. I've never been sexually assaulted. It doesn't really impact me. It does. It impacts every single taxpayer in this country. And I'll show you uh, some of the statistics right here. So we look at this table here. Yes, it's from 2009, but I'm going to draw your attention to the, all the items listed on the left and then take a look at the total. Okay. So just in the column violence against, uh, females, if you go through, you see all of the different aspects where money goes to fund the consequences of violence against women, just for women, it's almost $5 billion dollars. And whose dollars is that? A large majority of it is taxpayers' dollars. So if you think it doesn't affect you, you're wrong. It does affect you. All right. And I think I have another, another, uh, graph here. Yes. This one I find particularly interesting. The average annual inmate expenditure for federal correction services in Canada. And this is, um, 2010 to 19. So I'm sure there's newer, newer information, but an average annual inmate expenditure in 2019 was $120,000. Now I would love to make $120,000 a year. Um, so I find that it's really ironic, at least in, in my own case, that, um, the person that attacked me is being provided for in our prison system, food, clothing, shelter, and me, I'm trying very hard to earn an income, uh, applying for jobs, interviewing for jobs. You know, I, I teach part-time, but I have yet to find a full-time job and I would love one that pays that. I can tell you that much right now, but it just shows you the inequity that exists and the, the disparity. Yes. I know we need to spend money to keep people away from the public, but it just kind of, it just kind of shows the, the dichotomy, the, the, of, um, justice, I guess you could say, if that makes any sense. Okay. And we're, we're almost in the, we're on the last one here. Okay. Call to action. Number 32 is promote and train bystander intervention. Okay. Now this particular um, graphic, social media graphic speaks for itself, right? How many more reasons does there need to be? And that's going to go through the list. Femicide, sexual harassment, human trafficking, child marriage, FGM, rape, cyberbullying, sexual violence. The list goes on and on of how women are violated every year. And for what reason? Often it's just because they're females. So we need to promote and train intervention uh, be a champion 
and support women that have been victims of violence and educate yourself. Go into that prevention mode where if we know ahead of time, we can hopefully stop these things from happening. So if you found this video valuable, I'd encourage you to share it in your networks. I invite you to start a conversation about any of the 32 calls to action and challenge the current narratives. A link to shareable social, social media posts can be found in the description below. And I hope you will choose to be an active participant in the prevention, intervention, and champion to end violence against women and gender-based violence, starting with the month of November and carrying forward new attitudes into the new year. And if you are a woman who has been, uh, or is being victimized, you can take your power back by seeking support. The Canadian Women's Foundation might be a good place to start, and I'm going to just show that show that website right now. Okay, so the Canadian Women's Organization, uh, if you go to this website, can, uh, canadianwomen.org, uh, lots of great resources on this website. And if you scroll right down to the bottom, uh, seeking support, it asks that question, find resources. If you click on that button, it'll take you to the different provinces that you can uh, navigate your way through. Now, this is a, a Canadian site and I'm in Canada. That's why I'm sharing this. Um, if you click on, say, Ontario, um, it'll give you a complete list of all of the shelters in Ontario, crisis lines, how newcomers can be helped uh, dealing with the, the legal system in uh in ontario and so on so this is quite an extensive um website and i encourage you to to go through it and and find some help for uh helping yourself and helping to end gender-based violence so if there's someone in your life that you trust let them know that you need help we're stronger together if someone doesn't know you need help they won't know to help you. And if they know you need help, they can keep their eye out and watch and be your champion. So talk to someone that you trust. And, and if you don't have anyone that you can trust, start with the canadianwomen.org, go to their resources and, and start there. And I know in my own area of um, Durham, our victim services is an excellent organization that supports victims of, of violence uh, and sexual assault and uh, they're there and ready to help you thank you very much for watching and i'll end with be positive mm -hmm.